Welcome to this session. Um, thank you so much uh, for having us. Um, it's my first time in Berlin, Brussels, actually. And I live in Hamburg, so it's not that far away. But for some reason, I never made it. So I'm very happy to be here. And the idea for this talk to, is to talk about three common challenges which we encounter in distributed systems or microservices and patterns for overcoming those challenges and implementing those patterns with change data capture. So. In more depth, um, what can you expect? Uh, I hope you see my slides, by the way. So we are talking, uh, or we are going to talk about three different patterns. The first would be the outbox pattern, which allows us to exchange messages between microservices in a safe way. Then we are going to talk about the strangler fig pattern, which allows us to move to microservices coming from a world of, monolith, of a monolith. And lastly, we are going to talk about the Zaga pattern, which allows us to um, coordinate long running transaction flows across multiple services. And now, when I say we, uh, I'm not here alone. Uh, I'm here with my good friends, Hans Peter. So who am I? I work as a software engineer at Red Hat, and I'm the lead of the Debesium project, which is an open source implementation of change data capture. And I have the honor to be here today with uh, Hans Peter Grasel, who is a technical trainer at Nitconomy, and uh, he also works as an independent consultant and software engineer. So let's get started right into it. Um, and before actually I dive or I talk or before we talk about those uh, particular patterns, um, let me just give, give you briefly an overview of what the change data capture is about and what Debezium is about. And the idea is real simple. Essentially, you have a database and whenever there's an insert or an update or a delete, um, well, you would like to react to those events. So if there's a new customer created, purchase order gets updated or something gets deleted, you would like to react to that. And well, the canonical source for getting changes from a database is the database's transaction log. Each database has a transaction log and it's an append only log. Whenever something changes in the database, it will append an event to this log. And this is what the BSM uses as the change event source. So it taps into the transaction log, extracts the changes, and sends those events to consumers. And typically, this is done via Apache Kafka, which allows us to have some nice decoupling between the event source, which would be the database and the BSM, and the event consumers. And then consumers can subscribe to those topics. By default, we would have one topic in Kafka per table we are capturing, and they could react to those change events. We could use those change events to update the cache, a search index, um, to run streaming queries, or to exchange data between microservices, which is what we are going to focus on in this talk today. So that's change data capture in a nutshell. And I very briefly should talk about how those change event uh, change events look like. And in this case, in case of the museum, this is how uh, such an event would look like. It essentially has three big parts, like the old and the new state of the changed row, some metadata, um, and so the operation type and timestamp. So in the old and new row state, there we would have um, essentially a structure which resembles the tables we are capturing. So for each column in our capture tables, we would see one field in those uh, parts of the message. And now if this is an insert, we only would have the after state for an update. For instance, we would have both. So that's old and new row state. In terms of metadata, there's things like, what's the table where this is event is coming from? What's the database? Uh, maybe the query which caused this change. Um, does this come from what we call an initial snapshot of the data? And a few more metadata like this, or position in the log file, transaction ID, and so on. And lastly, we have this additional metadata like operation type. So is it an update? Is it an insert? Uh, sorry, is it an update? Or is it a create event, for instance? And the timestamp, when did this change happen? So those are the change events which are sent from the database, or which are extracted from the database by Debezium and sent to consumers via Kafka. So now let's see how we can um, use those change events for implementing those distributed uh, interaction patterns. And the first one would be the outbox pattern. And well, for each of the patterns, we are going to talk about briefly what is the problem which we would like to solve here, right? So, and here in this case, very often we have a situation where a service needs to update its own database. And then at the same time, it also would like to notify other services about uh, this uh, change which happened, which happened. So our database should be updated and we would like to send a message to other consumers, maybe via Kafka. Now the thing is, um, well, we would like to do this consistently, right? So we don't, we want to avoid a situation where we, for instance, do the database change, but not the write of the message to Kafka. So that's the inconsistencies we would like to avoid. 
And the trivial approach or the apparent approach maybe would be, um, well, to just do what's called a dual write, right? So our service would try and update its database. And at the same time, it would send a message um, via Kafka to consumers. But the problem is this what's called dual writes. It's not reliable. So as those two actions don't happen within one shared transaction, it could happen one of them gets applied and the other one fails. And now we end up with an inconsistent situation. So maybe we already have received and persisted a purchase order in our database, but then we forgot or just failed to notify the shipment service about this order. And obviously, that's a bad situation. So don't do dual rights. Now the question is, how can we avoid this? And how can we overcome this? And this is where the outbox pattern comes into the picture. So the idea there is, well, if we cannot update multiple resources, we always can update a single one, right? We always can go to our database. And that's the idea. So if a new request comes in, let's say for placing a purchase order, this service would update its internal table table model, so like uh, its order table or the lines table and so on. And then within the same transaction, it also would write a record to another table, which we call the outbox table. And this outbox table contains messages which are meant to be sent to external consumers. And then we would use Debezium to capture the changes just from this outbox table. So we would not capture changes from the actual business tables, just from this outbox table, and we would send them towards uh, those consumers. So how would this outbox table look like? Well, in this case, um, it's a bit based on the ideas of a domain-driven design. So you have columns there like aggregate type, which describes what's the kind of this aggregate. Is it an order? Is it a customer? Is it, I don't know, a recipe, or whatever your domain is about? We have things like an aggregate ID, which comes in handy for routing events to make sure we ensure uh, we have a consistent order of those events for the same aggregate. And most importantly, we have the payload. And the payload, that really is a structure which you define, so it could be anything. And in this case, it's a, like a JSON example, a JSON structure. And this is now the message which is sent towards your external consumers. And now, as you do this insert in your database, as part of the same transaction in which you also updated your business tables, you have, uh, well, transaction guarantees. And now, all this is applied using at least one semantics. So the business will extract the changes from the transaction log. And in case of a failure, it might go back and read a change which, which it already read before a second time. So consumers need to be prepared to see duplicates. But we will never miss anything. We will never end up with an inconsistent situation where we have updated our database and not send, send something to consumers. So that's the outbox pattern. We will later on see how we can use this uh, for more complex interactions. For now, let's talk about the strangler fig pattern. And uh, Hans-Peter can tell you more about that. Hans-Peter, over to you. All right, thanks, Gunnar. So uh, the nice thing about the strangler fig pattern is that uh, it can be explained based on a rather illustrative analogy we find in nature. So what you see in the background of this image, uh, of this slide here is uh, a tree structure. Uh, and this tree itself is wrapped into some other species of plants and they are called strangler figs. And uh, the interesting thing about them is their special growing behavior because those strangler figs they seed in the upper part of their host trees, and then they grow from top to bottom until they seed in the in, until they root in the soil themselves. Now, uh, what we can do is we can borrow from this idea. We can mimic this special growing behavior in a technical context, namely that of a software project migration. So uh, we want to show you uh, how you can use this pattern again to uh, migrate your uh, applications and. Uh, let's uh, assume, or I think many of you know that there are manifold challenges involved when you are um, tackled with the task to migrate an existing application into some newer form. Let's say we want to replace an old monolithic application uh, with some more modern microservices-based architecture. And uh, very rarely it is a good idea to try and do this migration in one big uh, chunk. Um, so writing everything in uh, your microservice stack and then uh, trying to have this hard cutover approach is oftentimes, uh, oftentimes doomed to failure. Now, instead, we should uh, do it in this strangler fix way and try to find a way to smoothly and gradual, gradually evolve our old system into uh, the newer architecture. And when we do that in a step-by-step -step way, this basically means that we have to find a way such that both systems, our monolith that we are uh, gradually uh, migrating over to services can coexist with this new services. 
Now, uh, how might this actually work, you might wonder. And uh, for that, let's discuss a, a, a concrete example here. What we see is a fictional monolithic application in the, in the domain of, of e-commerce here. We see uh, a couple of modules, uh, three uh, to, be, to be precise. And let's assume we want to now uh, migrate this monolith uh, into uh, microservices. So let's say we start this migration based on the customer module in the middle. Now, in the first step, we would introduce a proxy mechanism, could be Nginx or anything else that acts as a proxy. And at that uh, point in time, uh, all the proxy would do is uh, just a pass through all read and write requests to the monolith uh, as if uh, uh, nothing is uh, there yet. Uh, so then in a second step, let's uh, focus on the persistence layer. So here uh, we would need to find a way, again, we are talking about the customer module to bring all those customer related data into its own separate data store, uh, because this is how you typically do it. You should avoid to have a database uh, for your service or multiple services uh, that is shared. So we could uh, in, in, we could uh, configure uh, and use Kafka Connect. We could configure uh, a Debezium source connector that would, for instance, take all the existing data from a relational database system, bring it into uh, Kafka topics, uh, and uh, from there we could propagate it further with a so-called sync connector. Uh, Depending on what our data store at the target is, we can do that with out-of-the-box connectors just by means of configuration. So Debezium will not only bring those existing data over to uh, Kafka topics, but it will continuously listen to this, uh, to this uh, transaction log uh, and uh, propagate all changes further. Once we have the customer relevant data over there, we could shift our focus back to do the actual migration. We could write our uh, customer microservice and we could also do that in a stepwise fashion. Let's say we want to first introduce, uh, uh, support just uh, read-based scenarios. So we could do that. And once this is ready, we would then reconfigure the proxy and the proxy would make sure that it would route those client requests that uh, are have originally targeted the monolith for reads over to our new microservice. In a second step, we could then say we want to extend the microservice and also support write workloads. And again, once this is done, we reconfigure the proxy once more, and then it, uh, our microservice uh, would serve all reads and writes uh, that are uh, relevant for, for this customer service. At the same time, this means that we could uh, more or less shut down or, or get rid of this particular functionality in the monolith. And then um, once we write to the microservice, of course, it will happen in practice that other modules in our monolith might need to be aware of the changes happening in this new microservice and its own separate database. For that, we would then need to find a way to propagate those changes back into the monolith. And again, we could then just configure another uh, change data capture uh, connector uh, based on the Bezium, which uh, basically brings the data back to the monolith, of course, first into Kafka. And then from there, we have a sync connector. Uh, let's briefly reflect what uh, this approach would give us. Uh, so uh, as a first, uh, of course, main benefit, we can say that we can reach our ultimate goal of migrating a larger monolithic application uh, in an incremental fashion. This means we can take these baby steps, we can extract service by uh, feature by feature or module by module into their own services. Um, so uh, this means uh, inherently we can, uh, based on how we uh, just discussed it, support this coexistence. And another thing is that we can pause our migration at, after more or less every step along the journey. We could even say we, we want to completely stop the migration because maybe it was never the idea to migrate really the whole monolith, but only parts of it. So also this hybrid scenario is very well supported with that uh, strangler fig pattern approach. And depending on how we do it and if we get it right, we can also support rollbacks if we need to reverse some functionality because of some issues uh, that would happen, we could then uh, just go back uh, and migrate uh, the functionality back into the monolith. Again, the bottom line here is that what we want to achieve uh, is considerably lower migration risk than uh, when we would contrast that with the Big Bang migration. Now, uh, 
when we take a second closer look on uh, the CDC part of such a solution, we might get a slightly more nuanced view. Remember, in its uh, original and most uh, basic form, we learned today that CDC gives us this one-to-one -one replication of data between any two systems. And we, we do that basically on a record by record or change by change uh, fashion. Also, uh, we get uh, separate topics for separate tables, uh, usually from such CDC solutions as Debezium. And this raises a couple of questions. When we would transfer data in a one-to-one -one fashion, aren't we somehow leaking our data model from either side and thereby pollute each other's domain model? Um, or uh, what about uh, if we want to break free from that restriction of only having uh, uh, the possibility to transfer records in a one-to-one -one fashion. Maybe we want to uh, join records in flight. Maybe we want to, uh, in general, build any kind of aggregate structure. Uh, and the good news is that while all of these are legitimate concerns, we can address them. Uh, and the way we would do that is we would enhance this change data capture pipeline. Uh, and as a first improvement, we would, uh, for instance, uh, uh, bring in single message transforms or SMTs for short. What they allow us to do is we can manipulate the CDC payload in flight. And we can do that with many out of the box um, um, SMTs uh, just by means of configuration. Uh, typical uh, modifications are to just include or exclude a particular uh, a subset of the whole uh, uh, change event payload, or we could rename fields, we could change data types, we could mask sensitive data, we could fully encrypt data. Uh, and many, many more things. Um, also important to understand is that we can apply uh, SMTs on both sides of our data flow. We can use them uh, on the way into Kafka, so on the source side, or we can use them on the, from the way out of Kafka on the sync side, uh, wherever it is a better fit for our use case. Remember I said we want to uh, act upon more than one record uh, and a very commonly found use case here is that you need to somehow find a way to join parent-child relationships as they are commonly found in relational databases together. Uh, and maybe you want then to uh, have this coherent kind of aggregate consisting of the parent and all its child records and want to propagate that further towards uh, your sync. And this is where stream processes would come into play. So we could write, for instance, a Kafka Streams application, which does exactly that, uh, for uh, namely joining records based on their foreign key relationship uh, that they have in uh, the data source here. Um, when you think about that, when you extracted multiple services now, uh, you might reach the point where you might want to execute transactions across multiple services. And this is in general not easy. You try to avoid it as good as you can, but sometimes there's just no way around. And for that, we need uh, something more sophisticated. And uh, this brings me to the third and final pattern of today, which is all about sagas. So with that, back to you, Gunnar. All right, thank you so much, Hans-Peter. Um, yes, exactly. So, I mean, if we move to microservices from a world of, uh, or coming from a monolith, well, we would like to, as you say, we would like to avoid this need for multiple services to, you know, uh, interact and to achieve on one consistent outcome. But sometimes there's just no way around it. Um, no matter how you try and desire to work on your domain, um, you know, to really decouple your services, at the end of the day, there will be cases where multiple services need to collaborate and they need to achieve one consistent outcome. So that's that's the problem. So we have those, what we could call long running business transactions and now the problem is we don't typically have protocols like XA two-phase uh, commit protocols, which would have been used in the past for implementing such a logic, which is distributed across multiple databases. So typically we don't have such protocols in a world of microservices. Um, so still we have this need uh, for implementing such flows. And of course, again, it's very important to think about failure cases, right? So everything is always easy and nice if you just think about the happy path, but you also need to think about failure cases. So what happens if one of the services isn't available of it, or if it fails? Um, so how can we ensure we still have a consistent data outcome? So that's where the saga pattern comes into the picture. To give you one example, so again, we are in this um, domain of an e-commerce application. And let's say we have three services which are part of this um, interaction. So we have an order service, we have a customer service, and we have a payment service. And now what happens is this order service, it receives a request for placing a new purchase order. 
And now it needs to interact with those other two services. So it needs to reach out to this customer service to do some sort of credit limit check. So we would like to know, do we want to accept this order or you know, does this customer already have too many pending orders and we don't want to give him another pending order? So that's this credit limit check. And provided this is OK, so we essentially we allocate some credit limit in the customer service for this customer. Provided this is OK, we would like to go to the payment service and initiate the payment. And then the order would be in some sort of accepted state. So that's the happy path. But now let's assume this payment step fails. So for, the, for whatever reason, the payment doesn't go through. Maybe the credit card number is invalid, something like that. Well, then we need to go back to the customer service and we need to compensate. We need to undo what this has been doing before. So in this case, we would need to release this credit amount which had been allocated. And then we would be in some sort of order rejected state and the overall saga would be in a consistent state. So all the services have agreed on one final outcome. What's important to understand is there's uh, some reduced uh, guarantees in terms of the classical transaction uh, semantics. So if you think about asset transactions, what in particular, what you don't have is isolation. So if you think about it, this customer service, um, once it allocated this credit amount, um, this already would be visible to other uh, clients also while this entire flow still is running. And then maybe this payment check or this payment service, um, you know, it agrees or doesn't agree to the overall flow. And then uh, we might want to undo this change in the customer service. But for some time, the change in the customer service already was visible to, out, uh, to external clients. So we have re um, reduced um, isolation guarantees here. So that's the uh, that's an example. So now, how could this um, implement it using change that capture? And maybe you already already can guess it. So we have this very powerful tool of the outbox pattern. So the idea is to use the outbox pattern for coordinating this flow. So each service would always go to its own database do whatever it needs to do uh, in terms of updating its domain model, updating its own local state. And then it would send a message to the next service um, via its outbox table, uh, which then uh, takes over the flow. So the order service would send a message to the customer service. This will reply. Then the order service would send another message to the payment service, and this would reply. And then this flow would be um, successfully finished. Or in case of a failure, it would look like that. So again, the order service would uh, do what it has to do. It would then pass over control to the customer service. Um, this says, OK, that's fine. I, I can allocate this credit amount. So the order service reaches out now, or it sends a message to the payment service. And now this payment fails. So what we need to do now is we need to, again, go to the customer service and compensate this uh, previously executed action so to release the credit amount. So that's how if Saga flow could look like in sort of in, in terms of a failed Saga execution. So to make it a bit more tangible, let's take a look at a demo which I've prepared. And um, for the sake of time, I'm not doing this live, but I'm playing back a video. So and I'm going to run you uh, through what's happening here. So there's a few things running here. And um, I, uh, I got all this running via Docker Compose. So we can see what's in there. So we got Zookeeper, we got Kafka for our message exchange. We got Kafka Connect, which has the division connectors. And then we have, for each of the services, order, customer, and payment, we have um, a database, which is a Postgres database here for the sake of the example. And we have the actual service implementation, which in this case is a Quarkus-based microservice, uh, Quarkus being a stack for building cloud-native microservices. So all those things are running. The next step would be to register the Debezium CDC connectors. And we can take a look into the configuration of one of them. And here, uh, so that's an instance of the Debezium Postgres connector. It's going to the order DB host. It's using those credentials, order user, and so on. And then by means of those include filters, we are limiting what we are capturing just to this outbox events table. So that's the only thing we are interested in here. And then we are using a transformation, which is called the outbox event router, which essentially makes sure that the events from this single outbox table are routed into different topics based on the aggregate type so that the consumer can subscribe to just the changes of a particular aggregate type. So now we can place a purchase order, and I'm using uh, this very basic REST API in this order service. And now I can take a look into the Kafka topic or the Kafka topics which are used for this message, message exchange between those services. So the first one would be this credit approval request topic. So this has the messages which are sent from order to customer. And now as I place orders, 
purchase orders in the order servers, we will see or we see that the message is sent to the customer uh, to the customer service. And we also can take a look into the response topic. So now this, those are the messages which are sent from customer back to order. And again, I'm placing another order and I get another response back from customer to order. And now all those are in the proof in the approved status. So that's good. I could do the same for the exchange with the payment service, but really it's the same. So it's not so exciting. Instead, let's take a look into what's called the Zaga execution log. And this is essentially a table which lives within the order service. And this keeps track of the state of this Zaga. And now, well, again, I can use Debezium to extract the changes from this Saga execution log table. And this is, you know, we do it here for debugging or exploration purposes. So to see what's happening in this Saga table. There's two fields which are interesting there. So this is the Saga status, which describes the entire status or this, uh, of, of the Saga. And then the step status, which describes the status of the particular steps. So now, first of all, this is started. And then the credit approval step, this has been started. The credit approval step is in the succeeded state. Payment is started. And lastly, payment is succeeded. And the overall saga is completed. So that's a successful uh, saga execution. Now this order would be accepted. We could process. We could fulfill it. But also, let's take a look at a failed order. Now, in this case, I, am, I place an order which fails because the credit card number is invalid for the sake of the example. So how does that look like? So again, first of all, it's in the started state. The credit approval step that started, um, credit approval is succeeded, and payment is started. And now this payment step fails due to this invalid credit card number. And now we see this credit approval step, which was successfully ex um, executed before, this is now this compensating step, so which means we need to go back and we need to undo it. Um, so um, it's compensating. And the overall saga that's aborting, so we know we need to go back to this uh, to, to some sort of aborted state. And lastly, the credit approval step that is now compensated, payment has failed, and the overall saga that's in the failed state. And of course, we could now explore why is this uh, in a failed state, um, but that, that's, that's the basic idea. Um, stopping the demo here for the sake of time, there's uh, some more nuance to this. Uh, we could talk about um, item potency here, which is done about uh, by means of keeping track of the IDs of processed messages. You can see this in the entire demo, which we will share this a link to at the end of the talk, so you can see how this is implemented. All right, so let me go back to the slides. And um, we are pretty much done. I'm just handing over once more to Hans-Peter, who will uh, give us a wrap up and uh, some summary of this talk. Over to you, Hans-Peter. Thank you, Gunnar, for the nice demo. So yeah, we are about to wrap this up. So I think the uh, most important takeaway uh, for this session today is hopefully that we, we were able to show you that uh, CDC is a really powerful tool. In fact, it's, it's such a fund fundamental tool when it comes to building uh, event-driven architectures or, or microservices. Um, and we should really uh, use it beyond those uh, simplistic one-to-one -one replication kind of use cases that you very often see. So I hope this uh, explanation of uh, these three patterns, namely Outbox, Stranglerfig, and Saga patterns, uh, gave you some, some inspiration, some ideas how you could uh, make use of these uh, mechanisms in your own uh, real-world applications. Uh, also, uh, if you want to dig deeper, uh, I would really encourage you to try out uh, CDC for yourself uh, based on Debezium, which is uh, among the leading change data capture solutions, fully open source. Uh, in addition to just being uh, CDC, it comes with uh, handy SMTs, very convenient extensions such as uh, Outbox pattern support that we discussed today. Uh, and in that regard, actually, we would have uh, a, a call to action for every one of you. So if you would like to see um, uh, support for the Saga pattern, similar to what we have seen in, in the demo uh, from Gunnar, please uh, uh, more or less let us know uh, via the project's mailing list, which you can find on debezium.io. With that, uh, we want to point you just to some further resources. Again, uh, two very elaborate uh, blog posts about the Outbox pattern and Saga uh, pattern, step-by-step uh, -step instructions. The demo repository should be great because the demo you have seen uh, today, you can try it out on your own. So everything is there for you to run the demos uh, uh, at uh, the convenience uh, that uh, you can use it from your home just by using Docker. Uh, compose, uh, which is all you basically need to run those demos. Uh, with that, we want to thank you for joining again. Thanks for taking the time. 
we would appreciate uh, uh, to uh, to uh, get some questions and hopefully be able to answer them. Um, and yeah, let's do the live Q&A right now or discuss later in the breakout channel. Thanks.